Welcome back to Mare Day. Uh, we are now starting our discovery session, um, which is discovering blue technology, ocean technology. Very excited to have you all here. And just wanna remind everyone that today is about active support for our ocean. We can't do this work without your help. And we hope you can all help participate in reaching our goal today. We'll be posting links in the chat um, with more information about how you can support ocean science and MARE. And also want to encourage everyone to post questions and comments in the chat throughout the day and throughout our next session. We'll be trying to answer and on, on all your questions. So please don't hesitate. And now I'm going to pass this on to Dirk to start our Discover Blue Tech session. Thank you. Welcome, Dirk. Thanks, Natasha. I am really excited to introduce you to two dear friends of mine, Dr. Tierney Teese, a National Geographic Explorer, and Brett Hobson, an incredible ocean engineer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. They are the power ocean couple uh, with two uh, very ocean-oriented children. So um, you can read their bios online, but I just want to jump in with you two and ask you a, a couple of questions, uh, given your different perspectives about ocean. Starting out with a biggie, where can we make the biggest changes to ocean health over the next decade? Yeah, well, um, Dirk, th thanks for inviting us for this. Um, and a happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think it's really, it's such an exciting time to be in ocean conservation now. I mean, it's never been more vital, and but we have so many tools now to help make big changes. If we look, you say like in the next 10 years, well, 10 years ago, less than 1% of the ocean was protected. And now over the course of these past 10 years, we're up to about, you know, 7.8% of the ocean is protected in some way. That's that's a huge increase. The ocean is on everyone's radar. Um, but if if you dive into that statistic a little bit more, we have about two, you know, 2.7, less than 3% of the ocean is really solidly protected with MPAs and no-take zones. So we still have a long way to go. Um, the UN has has really decreed that they want to that really to safeguard ocean health, we need to protect. 30% of the ocean by 2030 and 2030 is right around the corner. <laughs> so some of the places where there are some really, really exciting advances. Um, one is something called the Blue Nature Alliance, which has just formed um, fairly recently. It's a bunch of heavy hitters coming together, including Conservation International, um, the Pew Charitable Trust, the Global Environment Facility, Mindaroo Foundation, as well as the Rob and Mil um, Milani Walton Foundation. And they've called together about $125 million to, to implement some large protection measures that'll cover about 18 million square kilometers. It's almost um, you know 7 million square miles. And they're focusing on um, you know, the Fiji and Lao, area, as well as Antarctica, um, as well as Tristan de Cunha. So, so that, that is with strategic conservation um, and working with local, local groups like in Fiji, indigenous cultures. Um, so that's, that's one aspect that's really coming a long way, strategic tactical conservation where people are working together instead of big groups trying to do their own thing coming together. Um, I think probably the biggest area that we will see change is in protecting the high seas. The high seas are half of our planet and they're two thirds of the ocean. So if we can protect the high seas, then we um, will make a massive difference in the health of the ocean. The, if, you look, if you look at the high seas um, and you sort of, work out the economics of it, it looks like there's profit to be made by fishing these far off remote waters with these massive nets that are, you know, you can fit 
dozens of 747s in a single one of these nets that create all these problems. But if you take out the subsidies, the you know that are bolstering ships to get out to these areas and paying for their gas, if you take out those those harmful subsidies and you you cost in the the amount of human trafficking and and essentially slave labor and horrible working conditions, um, that profit margin disappears. And it's a very, very costly endeavor. Plus, most of the fishes that are being caught out there are going to luxury markets like sushi, and it's not sustainable fish, fish markets. So if we can protect the high seas, and there's groups working very hard at this, like the High Seas Alliance, and making good headway, then we will make a huge change in ocean health. Uh, Brett, you talked to me once about there is a lot of life out there. It's not a desert at all, but it's dynamic, right? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, you look, it's an oligotrophic environment for the most part, um, and, and the crystal clear water, it's beautiful. And, and yet you see, you know, the fishing boats coming back with their tunas and, and all these apex predators um, on board. So, you know, what are they feeding? And, and unfortunately, you know, as those are being fished down, um, the fishing fleet are looking for the next um, kind of bounty. And those are, you know, the, um, the little mctopids, the kind of the smaller fish, that, the forage fish that, that those guys are feeding on. And they're, they're deeper. They're kind of the components of the deep scattering layer. And, and, and they're all down there. And they're, and they're, they're moving about. Um, so the, the fishing fleet's going to go to areas, general areas that um, have some upwelling, usually from eddies or something. And they'll just Fish, fish those general areas, but it's hard to hard to find them, hard to um, study them, um, and that's kind of one one of my concerns. Is just we don't really have uh, a good knowledge on the whole system out there. I mean, we're learning all the time of just basic carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, um, and you know how carbon being sequestered and what that baseline um, really is. So just that pure research of understanding the system, you know, while it's changing. But the sooner we can do that, the better. And, and get the baseline because we are having a huge impact on the high seas right now. Yeah. When you talk about the deep scattering layer, how deep is deep? Well, you know, the, these are mostly an, animals that are avoiding predation. So, so they're down below the photic zone during the day when the sun's shining because they're kind of um, they're they're easy prey um, it, from these visual predators. So, you know, the, um, uh, two to six hundred meters. So they're diving pretty deep, but of course that's the largest migration on Earth, the vertical migration. Uh, the diurnal cycle, as it gets dark, they come up into the surface waters to feed, and the light comes out, and they all move down. Um, and uh, it's you know it's lots of little, um, lots of different animals, mostly you know pretty small ones, but a lot of them. Um, so it's a, it's a big biomass, and the uh, you know as they fish the the um, the fancy fish out, and they start looking at that, um, you know the you're not going to see them on on a plate, um, but uh, they'll uh, they'll figure out ways to uh, turn that protein into food for for somebody. And and uh, we don't know much about it, so um, it, it it's not as it's also not a sustainable fishery. And and Trudy, you talked about how much protection is going on in the ocean, and we're, we're roughly double that on land, right? Is, is that about correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, you know, 90% of the living space on this planet is in the ocean. <laughs> and so we, if you, if, well, actually more than, it's more like 99. So if you flip that around, we live on 1% of the available living space. And, and that, you know, we have protected about 12% of the land. Protecting land presents, um, you know, a lot of challenges because you have, we're li this is where we live and we have different, uh, you know, cultures and industry, industries and developing and non, um, and developing nations. And, and so, so land protection measures come with a whole host of, of complications. Um, and when you look at some place like the high seas, you don't have people living out there. So some of those complications are alleviated and it gets more, into policy making, policing, and um, you know protection measures that way, where you're not ousting people from their from their homelands in order to put in a protective space. So, so um, um, I think I think our 
our potential for really making strong, measurable, significant, dramatic headway in ocean protection is, um, is looking good if we can protect those high seas. And it's the protecting and policing. It's you know, an immense area. So how, how do you um, do that? Um, you know, you don't put a fence around it, um, but there are tricks and technology is really going to be key there. Um, you know, eyes in the sky, um, uh, unmanned sy systems in the water, um, listening stations, uh, all those will work together at some point, but that's, that'll be a big challenge. Like if you look at, you think about Global Fishing Watch, this is a great organiz um, organization coming together of multiple technologies with satellite, um, satellite surveillance, um, as well as being able to know, to be able to identify which fishing vessels are where and when they turn off their positioning, <laughs> their posi positioning um, AIS, AIS yeah. sensors, um, you, that, that can raise a red flag. Um, but with something like Global Fishing Watch, I mean, the, you can monitor up almost 4,000 ships at the same time and track them and see where they're going, where they're offloading, if they're doing illegal fishing, um, you know, so that having these tools now, like we never have before, it's it's really empowered the the possibility of policing what is half the planet, you know, in real time. Well, wouldn't the challenge just be getting all the way out there? Because you talked about satellites, but there's also uh, surface robotics and subsea robotics. How do you mobilize a fleet that can? get there within gosh even a day or uh quickly enough to to make a change yeah yeah well um that persistence in the ocean is is a big challenge for for all kinds of robotics um and one of the keys to that is extracting energy from from the environment from you know, the sun from the wind from from the waves and and recharging systems in in situ or in the case of the um, the wave glider, you know, using the wave energy to propel yourself out there. But but um, that's uh, yeah, that's that's a big big area for development, and and um, a lot still needs to be done. And for coastal monitoring, it's it's fantastic. I mean, you've got all manner of different kinds of drones, underwater, eyes in the sky, um, you know, and and equipping local communities with these technologies and training them, getting them up to speed so that they can troubleshoot them, they can um, you know, fix them on the fly and be comfortable with them, that, that's critical. When it comes to these far off, um, you know, in the middle of the remotest parts of the Pacific, um, you really have to rely on satellites and machine learning and processing of those big visual data sets to to see what's going on and then nail them at the port. You know, don't spend all your money in your carbon emission, <laughs> emissions going out after them. Nail them in the port and where they're actually making their transactions, uh, their financial transactions. Oh, that makes sense. And then, so when, Brett, when you talked about, uh, you know, uh, wave gliders, like uh, the liquid robotics surface vehicle that uses wave motion to propel itself or the, um, what is the wind one called? Sail drone? Yeah, sail drone. Uh -huh. So that makes use of wind to navigate around. Would you envision uh, kind of an army of these out there, uh, knowing that the heavy lifting is being done by satellite, but that there would be some local presence as well? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I can tell you here, here in Monterey Bay, we love satellites, but, but a lot of the year, um, they can't see the ocean. Um, you've got clouds uh, uh, um, and it's obscured. So you need some boots on the ground, we call it, um, and, and systems like that um, will will be required. Or fins in the water. Yeah. Fins in the water, yeah. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> we can also enlist the, the help of our non-human kin, which um, I, I, I really support, you know, having the voiceless give their voice uh, as to what's important to them. We can't protect the whole ocean as much as we would love to, but if we can equip large uh, megafauna like ocean sunfish or tuna, bluefin tuna or elephant seals and equip them with, with um, 
increasingly sophisticated satellite tagging technology and sensors, those animals can go out, find the areas that are most important to them, record all the metadata that's so important, um, you know, the oceanographic data, and then bring that back to us. We can process that and say, okay, well, this is the area. This is these are the metropolises of of the ocean, the non the non human centric. Metropolis. These are the pickup joints, you know. These are this is um, you know the vacation hot spot. This is summer camp for for the white sharks, you know. So if you can, if we can work with all these marine animals and make the tags easier to carry, less invasive, then they can become our apprentice. They can become our accomplices in helping to protect their home, which which protects our home. I mean, we can't have, we can't be a healthy human species without a healthy ocean, so. I just came back from an expedition in Costa Rica where, where we tagged about, I wanna say about 25 silver tip reef sharks with a, an acoustic tag that would last for 10 years. Mm -hmm. They didn't like being pulled out and, and uh, uh, on the deck, but they, they all were put back in the water, very, very healthy. And the researcher in charge was saying that he's installing a bunch of listening stations at sea mounts uh, mm -hmm. between uh, Costa Rica and the Galapagos. And he thinks they may be using these sea mounts, not just for feeding, but also for navigating. And so he wanted to research that. And then as I learned more about sharks, I was fascinated to hear about their role as the apex predator. And they have a whole hierarchy there in Costa Rica with the tiger shark at, at the top. But could you guys talk to the importance of apex predators and, and why we should care more about the 100 million sharks that we're killing annually for mostly their fins? Yeah, I mean, it's not, um, I, I don't think like, we should really be too scared of, of shark bites when we're the ones who are really biting the sharks much harder than they're they're biting us. But um, not to not to um, I know some people have been bitten by sharks, but we we certainly take a bigger bite out of out of the sharks than than they us. Um, yeah, so sharks are are these you know controlling forces, and a healthy a healthy ocean ecosystem has a healthy proportion of these top predators like tunas and like like sharks. If you remove those those um, those top predators, you're going to have the grazers populations increase in size and they can overgraze, just like what you see on land. You can see these trophic cascades happen. Like on the um, you know the east coast of the US, you remove the sharks and then the some of the rays come up and they decimate the the scalp fisheries. So you you know there's You've got a checks and balances when you've got multiple multiple species that are multi at multiple trophic levels. And when you start taking one whole level away, you get a cascade of effects and unintended consequences. Um, and then you know you start when you move remove that large portion of biomass, you start fishing down the food web. Well, then if you start taking away all the grazers, then you're going to get algae overtaking your reefs. You're going to get, all, we know, too much primary productivity there. Um, especially if you're pouring fertilizers and pollutants into the ocean, that's over fertilizing and creating more algae. And that leads to dead zones, hypoxic areas. As the algae decay and you, um, you're sucking oxygen out of it, out of the system. So, you know, you you like John Muir says, you you pull on one thread, and you, you're attached to the whole universe. That's a rough paraphrase of one of his famous quotes. And um and we see this when you start to pull entire populations out, that whole fabric of the ecosystem starts to unravel. Well, we saw that here in California with uh, the sea star wasting disease. So who knew it that our sea stars were a dominant seafloor predator helping yeah. the sea urchins in check. And when that disease wiped out 99% of them along the West Coast, the sea urchin population skyrocketed it. And then they uh, not only grazed a lot of kelp, but they also outcompeted 
the less nimble abalone. And so that had been a recreational fishery and that's been closed for four years and probably the foreseeable future. So, the, so that's kind of an example, right? It just allows one animal to dominate at the expense of other ones. Yeah, I mean, when you have something like, like you know, the sea star wasting disease come in or, you know, you had um, urchin diseases in the Caribbean, it never recovered from that either. Um, but the sea star wasting disease, and then you get all those urchins and then they go into their, their zombie mode. You know, you see these urchin barons and there's no food for them. So they just sort of shut themselves down. They don't die, but they shut themselves down. And they don't have any tasty morsels inside. So the earth, the otters are like, oh, we don't want to eat those. They're just a bunch of, you know, calcite plates with spines on them. No, thank you. So they'll go and they'll forage on the urchins that are eating the kelp and are rich with bro inside. So meanwhile, you've got all these urchins that aren't dying and they're occupying all that space. And they'll resurrect when they get a little bit of food. But yeah, no, it's a big problem. And our kelp is really suffering from it. Of, kelp, of course, the kelp forests provide these massive habitats for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of rock fish, rock fish species and more. Yeah, yeah three-dimensional habitat like sequoias of the ocean. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brett, I had another question for you. You, you mentioned um, something about eddy field hotspots. Can you define what that is for our audience? Well, I, you know, we were talking about the the open ocean and 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 where are the where are the hot spots here close close to shore? We'll go to the shelf break. We'll go to these these um, uh, zones that are um, uh, kind of create upwelling or some some frontal boundary, and those those are the hot spots. But as you move offshore, where where the bottom you know drops away and no longer really influences um, the the surface currents. Um, uh, it turned out that that these big ocean eddies are the disturbances required to bring nutrients up up to the surface. So so that's where these upwelling events happen it, or, or on the, the edges um, and, and and parts of these open ocean eddies. And and that's you know it's a, it's a moving system um, and they're you, know, uh, you can see them very well with satellite altimetry. Again, re relying on on our uh, eyes in the sky um, and um, um, yeah, they're remote, um, mm -hmm. difficult to study, but that's, uh, that's where the open ocean um, uh, ecosystems thrive is on, on those boundaries. And it's at um, the counterclockwise eddies, um, the, the surface depresses, it allows the, the nutrient rich waters to come up into the photic zone where, um, where, where the, all the nutrients have been consumed and as they come up, it creates a, a little upwelling. Uh, you get uh, the nutrients, you get sunlight, uh, phytoplankton, then the grazers and the apex predators. Everybody's kind of focused on that that new feeding feeding source. So you're well, the question, cafeteria uh, uh, for all different animals out there. I mean, even the big ones. Well, you know, it starts start out at the bottom. You know, with with the nutrients, uh, the small uh, small plankton. Um, but then it, it quick, quickly works right up. You get the you know, squid and mctopids and, and, and these other forage fish uh, eating that, and then they become the targets of, of the bigger ones. You get a, a phase lag um, as, as they grow, but that's, um, that's, uh, that is the source. It starts, starts there. It's so, what's so cool, what I love is that you can actually see these frontal zones with satellites, you know, um, like synthetic aperture radar. So just a terrific tool. You can actually you actually see frontal systems via satellite, and with that kind of you know power, then we can you know you can track those. And and there is um you know a really a really hot idea right now. It's hard to implement, but it's this idea of dynamic marine conservation, where you know like like Brett said, you have these mobile areas. You live in the ocean. You, you, your your house has wheels. It's you know it, you have a mobile address. It's not just you live in this one Latin long. Maybe you do if you're a coral reef fish, but um, but off offshore, your address is at the whim of these eddies and these you know um, these 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 mobile mobile water masses. So so if you can track those 
and you know that's where a spawning aggregation is going to happen, or that's where, um, you know, some some um, really important marine processes are happening. You can protect it, but then you don't have to protect that area the whole time. You'd only find seasonally when that's the most important time to protect it, like a migration corridor, or leatherback sea turtles, things like this. So there are some already dynamic marine protection measures in place, but we can up that. Um, the more we find out using the tools that you know Brett's talking about and getting these baselines and understanding these movements, then we can better hone our ability to dynamically protect the ocean as well. We were part of a project uh, with sea cucumber fishery here in California. So the sea cucumbers were overfished kind of in concentric rings around Asia. And down in Santa Barbara, there was a thriving fishery because at a certain time, the sea cucumbers, you, it's hard to think of slugs kind of migrating, but they did get much denser in the shallower waters where divers could get them. So mm. it was $5 a piece, a big uh, warty sea cucumber. So they were pretty lucrative fishery. And then it, then it was discovered that that was during a mating aggregation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the fishermen lobbied to have the fishery shut down during that time. Yeah. Preserve uh, kind of the capital of that stock so that it would be around um, longer and not get exterminated. And that was, in a, uh, I guess, a great case for marine reserves. There was no fishing allowed at any time at those addresses, those fixed mm -hmm. locations in marine reserves. So they were the ones who regenerated that sea cucumber population. And now the laws are working in concert uh, with your da dynamic um, marine conservation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of times when you see those aggregations, they're they're getting stuff done <laughs> for the species, and you want to let them leave, leave them in peace, let them do what they need to do, as as well as you know, um, you know who you who you decide gets caught. Like you know, in the ocean, it's great to be an old fat female fish. Uh, old fat female fish are the ones that are cranking out more young, and the young that they crank out are are more viable than the young skinny females. So it really rocks to be an old fat female in the, in the ocean when it comes to fish. And those are the ones you want to protect, you know? Um, so you have to know qualitatively and quantitatively and geospatially where to put our protective measures. So, so that leads me to kind of our, our last series of questions. So when you look at where we are now, what tools are you most excited about? Maybe emerging tools, and those could be thoughts or policies uh, going forward. You want to? No, no, go um, for it. Well, there's a, there's a whole host. I mean, we've, we've talked about a bunch of them. A, a lot of it is, um, <laughs> this may seem, this may seem odd, but, um, Getting a better understanding of the psychology of humans, you know, uh, if you really want to protect the ocean, you should get a degree in psychology. <laughs> I tell I tell all the students students I mentor now, I'm like, if you believe in ocean conservation, double major in biology and psychology. Um, and I think we are getting a better understanding of what motivates human behavior and decision making and behavioral change. So, I'm. And I'm fascinated by that. And I think we're making great headway in understanding behavioral change um, when it comes down to more sort of traditional or innovative marine, marine um, protection technology, things like um, the advent of eDNA, environmental DNA. So we can actually get censuses of who's, who's living where um, even when they're not there, they leave behind the beauty of eDNA is that um, an animal will leave behind a wake of its presence and it doesn't have to be there. Um, and we can just go and take a water sample and say, oh my gosh, look, these, these actually do exist and probably in these kinds of, of numbers. So we can get more accurate representation of who's living where and when. Um, Certainly our satellite technology has gotten better and better in our machine learning and um, ability to crank through big data sets. Um, and we are working strategically with, with you know, like the High Seas Alliance, case in point, it's 40 different um, NGOs 
along with the IUCN, the International Union for um, the Conservation of, of Nature, all coming together with a single focus. And, you know, like the Blue, Blue Nature Alliance and Mission Blue. So we have, we have all these organizations that are being tactically smart and pulling the public in, showing the public where they can, they can um, play a part. They can um, have such a huge impact with their choices that they make at the market, the people they vote into power. Um, you know, citizen science is going through the roof right now with iNaturalist and, and, and um, you know, we're finding new species all the time by pulling people in. So those are some of the tools I'm most excited about. And of course, satellite tags are getting better and better. <laughs> and acoustic tags. So we, we have a question. Uh, can, can you guys see the question that came in? That's a really good question about fishing industry. You want, or I can read it to you if you want. Okay, we got it here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, how will we be able to prevent the fishing industry from using the technology you talk about, from using it to the detriment rather than preservation. And of course they do. Um, uh, they, they use the satellite imagery to see where the eddies are and the frontal boundaries and, and uh, um, yeah, some. Um, but there are time lags that are implemented with scientists will implement time lags for their data sets too. So, so that um, that is part of it. I mean, not all of this, not all of these data are publicly available. You know, like the, I know with um, um, SAR, um, you, you have to put in proposals to get those data. And those proposals have to be peer reviewed. So, but when we're talking real time, um, like with Global Fishing Watch, I, I don't know if that all those, that the level of resolution, some of it's available to the public, but the high level rev, rev, um, resolution isn't isn't widely available. So I know there are some safeguards put in there. Yeah, and there could be more. Uh, uh, just that 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 time lag, not having real time up. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, anybody can learn um, about the system and, and see what's happening with a with a delay, um, but you can't use it for the advantage of of going to a spot um, and 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 fishing. Some of the mm -hmm. you know the other technologies um, that are providing us open ocean access with with robotics. That's um, um, you know, those, those data come in um, and, and the papers that are published, you know, there's a big, big lag. So um, uh, that's not, not helping them, but, but the real time um, is a concern. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had a concern too, as we were quantifying who was living where in marine reserves and it, parts of it were publicly funded by the state of California, Fish, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife is through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, you could you could demand to see those results, and um, it, it's a dilemma because, of course, uh, it is the public that supports it, and then there's very savvy uh, fishermen out there in our what I consider our national trust that um, are harvesting the bounty, and so it's a dilemma going forward. How do you, um, I guess, meter out the information to educate but but not harm those resources? Well, and then you just have to have stronger implementation um, protection measures implemented so that, um, you know, the data are out there, but if they're not legal, they're not supposed to be fishing those, those species, then they get, they get um, you know, punished if they do. So, so yeah, it's all about policing these large areas. So besides... Uh boning up on anthropology and psychology, what are some ideas that you would advise us uh, to do? Like if a couple of things that we could each do to promote ocean health. Well, that's, do you wanna go? No. There's, um, <clears throat> there's a lot, there's a lot. And there's, there's different, you know, we say the ocean's dying a death of a thousand cuts, there's a thousand solutions. And, and every one of them is a win-win. So, you know, we know that we are raising the temperature of the ocean and dropping the pH, making it more difficult for calcium carbonate creatures to make their shells. And um, so, you know, switching to renewables and reducing our carbon footprint, that's huge. 
It's a win-win across the board. Um, being really conscious and knowing that when you say, are you gonna have fish for dinner? Not all fish are created equal. Fish are so vastly different. Fish, you know, the first fish appeared over 500 million years ago and we have 36,000 species and they're all so different and they all fulfill such different functional roles that um, you really need to know what your species, what species you eat and to be conscientious about eating very low on the food chain. Don't eat a top predator. You don't eat a tiger. Why would you eat a, you know, a shark? or a bluefin tuna, it's like eating a tiger. Um, it takes a huge amount of biomass to make that one bluefin tuna. So eat low on the food chain and you don't even need to eat fish really. Do you need to eat fish? Maybe mm -hmm. you wanna give up fish. <laughs> um, but, but I know lots of people, their livelihood revolves around having to get fish on, on um, having to catch fish so, and have that as a protein source. But, but you know, really be conscious about what kind of fish you're eating. Also, when it comes to plastic pollution, we have all heard of the great garbage patches that are now in every single um, ocean basin. What we wear sheds from our body into our, into our washing machines, out our dryer vents, and those little microfibers get into everything in the ocean, everything from the copepods up, and we end up eating those plastic fibers. And they're not just physical, obstruction you know they actually can attract pollutants like ddts and pcbs so we're actually poisoning ourselves by wearing clothing that's made from petroleum and having it the little microfibers get into our water streams and out into the ocean so choosing our clothing wisely is a huge thing we can do and have a lot of fun with it i mean i'm wearing wool and organic cotton um, and so when these fibers come off of my clothing, they will degrade into a nutrient instead of a pollutant. And um, so that's another big project I'm working on is searching the world for sustainable textiles and, um, and trying to show that there are exciting alternatives out there. So what we clothe, how we travel, what we eat, and then, and then you know, what we teach our kids. And getting them out there in the ocean, having them love the ocean, because you've got to love it before you really will protect it with a passion. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up seed literacy, because uh, we certainly need help in sciences and policy and governance uh, enforcement. Um, what would you advise? Like, I, hopefully the youngsters are back in school right now, but if they are happening to watch, uh, what would you tell tell somebody who's say in middle school or high school? Just stay curious, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, ask ask questions. Um, um, yeah, figure out what's how the system works. Who's living out there? You know, what's just in in your backyard? You know, um, you, know, you know, what 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 whales are they seeing out out there this this week? What are the currents? What's the temperature? Just um, just kind of being aware of your your ocean backyard. There's a great program called Seek. It's like the kids version of iNaturalist. And they can download that and start catalog cataloging all the bugs and the and if they go tide pooling, all the crazy critters and nemerdines and, and eels and octopus that they find. And if they don't know what it is, they can just post a picture and there's a whole arsenal of experts that can help identify it within minutes sometimes. We found a whole new species of ocean sunfish that's stranded on the shores of Santa Barbara because someone uploaded it into iNaturalist. And um, the, the person who had di di discovered that species, Mayan and Igard, saw it and was like, my gosh, that species usually is only down in Australia and <laughs> in the Southern Hemisphere. And what's it doing up in Santa Barbara? And that's just because someone was out on the beach, beach combing, they saw it. They uploaded it onto iNaturalist. So using the technology to, to you know, connect everybody, um, but, but not being so immersed in the screens that you're not actually seeing the real world. So I think getting people outside, especially kids, um, getting their feet wet, getting them the sand between their toes, it's <laughs> important. <laughs> That's good. I've been pretty impressed by a lot of the youth of today, just how passionate they are about 
climate change. Oh and, yeah, and it's something they're going to inherit. And how do how do we as uh, we're becoming the old guard? How do we empower them to do that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what do we what do we want to be remembered for by by all the things we've destroyed or by all the things we've created and nurtured and you know brought to to a thriving condition i think when we think legacy how do we do we want to be remembered as that species with that one layer of plastic in the fossil strata the, the techno fossils that we left behind or or is our age going to be the age of abundance and ecological restoration and and rejuvenation personally i i, I want the latter Yes, well, you, you've caused a whole bunch of questions. Let me read you the first one. You mentioned many large fishing vessels are subsidized and wouldn't be economically sustainable if they weren't. Mm -hmm. Who are the biggest subsidizers of these vessels? Mm -hmm. Well, you can look at the, the main five, five countries that are putting them out there. So you've got um, Spain, China, um, Japan. Um, Indonesia. Yeah, yeah, some of this. But um, but and the EU has provided harmful subsidies, lots of harmful subsidies. I mean, it's upwards of about four billion dollars a year, um, and and that's just to pay to pay for gas because there's a, a strong lobby of uh, fishermen who are putting politicians into power and they want to be protected, and so those subsidies come in to pay for the gas, the fuel. Otherwise, it wouldn't be economically viable. So, so yeah. And it's dirty fuel. It's some of the dirtiest burning fuel we have. So the the climate uh, impact is ter tremendous. Oh, it's it it is massive. And then the ghost the ghost um, nets that are left behind, um, which just keep fishing. So the detritus that's left behind, the, the debris, the marine debris. So between that and then just um, the horrible working conditions. Where these um, vessels, uh, the you know, like the the fishermen are picked up in Myanmar, and then they're not allowed to get off the ships for upwards of of four to five years. You know, um, I really I really um, encourage listeners to look at Ian Urbina's work on um, the Outlaw Ocean, where he he goes into great detail about the human cost of industrialized fishing. And it's absolutely heart-wrenching, but he is, his work is really making headway and putting it on the radar of governments across the world. So I, I hope they look at Ian Urbina. He's doing phenomenal reporting. Um, Tierney, you've also generated a lot of interest in clothing because you're modeling some right now. I think uh, we have a couple more questions. Are there places that make resources like finding sustainable textiles a bit easier for people? Or at this point, is this something that individuals have to navigate and figure out on their own? Oh, well, I'm so glad you asked that because that's the project I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some really good places that you can, you can look. Um, there's um, like the textile atlas sort of gives you a nice uh, overview of different kinds of textiles that are out there. Um, there's um uh, oh let's see what the um green green textiles let's see but my project well i haven't launched i haven't launched it formally so it, it's gonna it's around the world native fabrics but so you can stay tuned on that portal um which will be launching next next month um and um there's let's let's see the um what's the one i'm i'm blanking on textile atlas um Oh, I don't know why I'm blanking on all of them. <laughs> um, there's the sustainability index, um, textile sustainability. And, um, you know, Dirk, what I will do is, why don't I just send you a list of, um, of reliable, good sources so people can click on those and they can see. But, but it is... The reason I started my project was that it was it's kind of all over the board. There's a lot of lot of places that are doing it, but there's no real central portal. And just because um, they say organic, um, yeah, there's a lot of greenwashing, you know. Um, do, 
companies will say that they have a biodegradable material and they all they have to have is like 10% organic material in it to then be able to say that they're a biomaterial. And when, in point of fact, they may have created a monstrous hybrid that's even harder to, to recycle. So um, so there's no place that's kind of putting them all together, but but um there are there are definitely some 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 really good groups out there. Um and I will send a list to you so it's easy for people to your listeners to click on them. That that'd be fantastic because an, an, another uh, person wrote in and, and said that uh, sometimes labels are misleading. And so how Oh, oh yeah. So Especially when it goes cotton. What was the name of your portal or the thing you're starting next month? I didn't catch that. Yeah, it's called Around the World in 80 Fabrics. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, we're, we're making a, a, a quilt. We're making a book. Um, we'll have a, a big social media feed um, and and also a um, podcast. So so that's, um, that's all coming. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us um, and generate so many new ideas and thoughts and expose us to kind of current and technologies and those coming down the pike and big ideas. Um, this was really exciting for me and I learned a lot. I have a copious amount of notes here and, and these are being recorded. So um, please tell your friends to watch Tierney and Brett. And um, we hope you'll join us uh, in a, I think it's about an hour with Dr. Peter Etnoyer. He's gonna talk about deep sea corals and the impact of the BP oil uh, blowout and the value of having baselines in place to be able to assess damage um, and, and bring uh, guilty parties uh, to the table to pay reparations. So mm -hmm. thank, thank you very more. much, but Natasha. Uh, well, thank you, Dirk, for you, Dirk. For, uh, um, <laughs> for starting Mare and, yeah. and Natasha for organizing all of this today. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, Dirk, Tierney, and Brett. Um, incredible work really happening in our ocean. And I'm so excited about all of this technology that we're talking about. And it, as you all said, we have the knowledge, we have the technology, and now we need the political will and the public push really to make yeah. these things happen. And um, the time is now, we've got the technology and we're really excited um, to learn about what everyone else is doing and to share with you guys what Mari is doing as well. So I just wanna thank you all for coming and also um, just give you a little update. You guys can stay on if you'd like. I'm just gonna be a couple of minutes here. Um, so uh, we, have a, we have two more sessions coming up and we hope you will join us at one o'clock Pacific um, and three o'clock Pacific to talk about blue parks and deep sea ecology and five o'clock for our, our celebration and Mare Garitas. And I just wanted to, to really thank all of the support. Um, as you guys have been talking, we have been getting donations all day. Uh, we've reached 70%, 74% of our goal uh, for Mare Day. I'm really excited. And Mare is extremely fortunate to work with amazing partners. We work with the state of California, NOAA, um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, others. And in order for us to really advance our tools and the hardware and ROV technology that we use and the data analysis piece, we have constant research and development. And in order for that to happen, we really rely on individual donors like you all that are watching today to expand those capacities. There are scientific advances in technology like we just talked about. And we are, there's new advancements in artificial intelligence and AI technology that Mari is working on to advance our capacities. But in order to do this, we need your support. So please continue to um, listen today and support ocean science. And we will see you all at one o'clock. Thank you.